Today's webinar is Fit for Purpose Land Administration with LADM, the Land Administration Domain Model. With the many challenging environments around the world, it's not clear what is the best technology to use. It's difficult to understand how to get started, justify costs, and how to put together a sustainable system. Today we'll be talking about how GIS is used in Fit for Purpose Land Administration and discuss a specific case study, their challenges, and what the business drivers were and hopefully we can answer any questions you have uh, so you can get started as well. Here's a summary of today's agenda. We'll have a brief discussion of ArcGIS and then how ArcGIS is the configurable infrastructure for land administration systems of all types. Then we'll get into the details and close with a case study in India. At any time during this webinar, if you have questions, please enter them into the, into the GoToWebinar questions box. We'll try to answer them as we go along and take questions at the end as well. We have a few technical people online, so hopefully we can answer anything you throw at us. I'm Brent Jones, the Industry Manager for Land Administration here at Esri. Presenting with me is Tim Fella. Many of you may know Tim. He leads the International Business Development and Land Administration here at Esri, and he has an extreme amount of experience with land systems working around the globe. It's great to have him with us today. Frank Pitchell is the Chief Program Officer at Cadasta Foundation, an Esri business partner. He's a land administration specialist with experience in designing, managing, and implementing land-related projects with a technology focus around the world. Cadasta Foundation provides an open platform that enables property rights to be documented and administered by the individuals and communities that own them, in concert with government land agencies where possible. He's going to discuss project specifics and how to get started. GIS has evolved and will continue to evolve, leveraging technology innovations, available data, and GIS innovations itself. Many of you work with GIS in some way or another, but the capabilities of the platform have exponentially grown in the recent past and will continue to do so. Many of these advances deliver capabilities to non-GIS users, so if you're not currently using GIS, don't worry. It's convenient to think about GIS as a platform or geospatial infrastructure to collect and manage all types of data, analyze, map, and visualize that data, and share that data as data services, maps, and applications. GIS is critical in land use planning, develop, development, and for policy decision making. And it's a platform for land administration organizations to share all land-related data with stakeholders and the public. Because the platform is services driven, the ArcGIS platform integrates all business systems, registry, title, e-recording, and it's easily configured. GIS delivers powerful capabilities inside an organization and to outside organizations as well and to the public. Land information, property characteristics, and parcels are needed by nearly everyone in government and many communities in the private sector. GIS has all of the building blocks for land administration systems, enabling many different configurations responding to different legal systems, requirements, and local capacity. From collecting, managing, mapping, and visualization to analytical capabilities and monitoring, this geospatial infrastructure delivers all the necessary capabilities across land organizations. As you will hear later in the webinar, Fit for Purpose is a new approach, and the ArcGIS platform has con been configured to meet these new requirements. ArcGIS integrates and enables sharing of all types of data. Often we use imagery to supplement our base maps. We integrate tabular data on valuation and data from other systems to lever leverage the spatial analysis capabilities in ArcGIS. Exciting in the world of parcels is 3D data integration, LIDAR, and seamless import from BIM, enabling 3D cadastre and valuation capabilities. Whatever data you have, it can be integrated into your GIS and combined with other data for analysis, visualization, and sharing through web services, apps, portals, and hubs. ArcGIS delivers value by man managing and analyzing land information. This includes technical mapping of deed descriptions for cadastre and tax systems, but also includes mapping for damage assessment, valuation, offshore, and underground env environments. Importantly, 
In addition to mapping and information management capabilities, ArcGIS includes the applications for scheduling and managing work in the office and in the field. ArcGIS supports all land administration workflows, tenure and ownership, stakeholder and public engagement, land use controls and land management, and valuation. Within each of these broad land functions are apps, applications, and data to support these workflows. We're going to discuss a configuration for fit for purpose, leveraging the land administration domain model, LADM, all on a single configurable platform. But before I pass this over to Tim, I'd like to mention a couple a uh, couple of things to help you stay connected with us. Here are a few resources that will help you keep current and get the most value out of your GIS. We have a meetup, uh, essentially an informal web meeting, where we discuss just about everything land records. We have one for valuation as well. Land records meetup pri primarily focuses on parcels, and the assessors and GIS meetup is focused on valuation, modeling, and assessor and valuer workflows. We also have GeoNet. It's like the Facebook for GIS users. Here you can post questions, connect with peers, and get access to a lot of resources. All the recorded meetups are posted there. So please join these meetups. On the Esri training and learning site, there's limitless amounts of training and learning plans available to you, so please check that out too. Now over to Tim. Thank you, Brent. All right, so we're going to dive into fit for purpose land administration. So when we discuss fit for purpose land administration, it's important to put it into the context of when land information systems developed across the world. In the more developed economies, most land information systems were beginning to be deployed in the 80s and 1990s. However, in developing and transitioning economies, it really wasn't until the late 90s and 2000s that funding started to flow towards digital transformation and the use of land information systems. What this chart shows is that the pace of technological change has grown exponentially, and the ability of different stakeholders to adapt hasn't been uniform. In fact, government has been one of the least able to keep pace, and this has helped contribute to this concept of fit-for-purpose land administration. So what is fit for purpose land administration? Well, the World Bank and the International Federation of Surveyors defined in 2014 a number of attributes related. And that includes the flexibility in terms of spatial data capture approaches, inclusivity in terms of the type of tenure and land that is recorded, that's participatory in the approach that data is captured, that's affordable, reliable, attainable within a short amount of time, and that it's upgradable. And all of these attributes related to fit for purpose land administration must apply to the core functions and responsibilities of a land administration authority. This includes the collection of data in the field or at the counter, the management of that data according to different accuracy standards, workflows, and data models, and the processing of different services and products, and the sharing of that data out to other government departments and the public. The land administration community's response to this concept of fit for purpose can be broadly categorized into one of the following three areas. On one of the end of the spectrum, we have seen highly customized systems develop that have long development life cycles, are difficult to maintain, and are not easily upgradable. They also require skilled staff and understanding of the custom code in order to support the system, which can be difficult to provide in some countries. On the other end of the spectrum, you've more of a COTS-based approach. This commercial off-the-shelf software with workflows designed to meet the requirements of a broad community of stakeholders, and in this case, cadastral agencies, and the drawbacks being that unique requirements may be missing and the client will be dependent upon some of the vendor licensing costs. In the middle, there have been an abundance of open source mobile data collection tools developed that can support data capture in the field, but they tend to be limited in scope and functionality and oftentimes cannot scale and don't provide capabilities related to the ongoing updating and maintenance of that data after first registration. Each country and context may have justifiable reasons for choosing a COTS or a custom design system. The two aren't mutually exclusive either. One can have a commercial off-the-shelf system 
that is extendable with customized workflows or business system integrations. However, when you look at the characteristics of fit-for-purpose land administration, and you compare that to both a commercial off-the-shelf solution and a custom design system, one can see that there are more there may be more alignment between a COTS-based system and fit for purpose. The reason being is that COTS tends to be tested more extensively, can be quicker or more affordable to deploy, is supported by dedicated technical maintenance teams, and is more easily upgradable. And I'd argue that upgradability is quite important, particularly when considering fit for purpose land administration. ArcGIS is an upgradable, scalable, and modular platform. One can get started with our hosted solution, ArcGIS Online, where one has access to ready-to-use applications to support key workflows related to field data collection and data sharing. Through ArcGIS Online, one can also access ready-to-use content, including high-resolution global imagery and base maps for free. Over time, as the technical capacity of staff increases within an organization, as well as the volume of transactions and the need for greater accuracy intensifies, one can graduate to utilizing Esri's purpose-built parcel editing solution, the Parcel Fabric, which has built-in workflows and the ability to improve the accuracy of your parcel map over time. Finally, that small department solution can evolve into an enterprise production system that leverages server that can enable multi-user editing and the publishing of services. The fit for purpose land administration solution I just referenced is based on the WebGIS pattern. WebGIS leverages web services and can be hosted in the cloud or it can be deployed on one's own infrastructure. Users within the system have an identity which controls what data they have access to and whether they can simply view the data, edit it, or publish. Another core component of WebGIS is the concept of a web portal. The portal is an essential component of a modern GIS system. The portal is a virtual location where one can store and share their authoritative content with others. One's access is controlled via their identity within the system and which groups they are a part of. The portal also supports a geo-information model allowing the integration and use of varying data types including web maps, layers, and 3D scenes. In addition to your own content and data, included with your ArcGIS license is access to one of the world's largest repositories of geographic data. This includes global base maps, imagery, demographic data, as well as content that is made public by the ArcGIS global community. Some of this data is curated regularly by Esri, whereas others are acquired and made available by our ArcGIS users. WebGIS also makes accessible GIS template applications and web app builders. These app builders do not require any coding and can leverage a wide variety of widgets or functions such as editing, navigation, or simple queries of the data consumed in your application. Apps built this way can also have their own look and feel configured to match that of your organization. In addition to web app builder, Esri has developed a wide range of web applications that can support specific workflows. These workflows can be field-based, used in the back office, or can be leveraged to engage or share data with the public. The applications extend your web GIS and geo-enable other parts of your organization. This cloud-based web GIS solution that I've just spoken about, and which includes the portal, living atlas content, web app builders, and access to a wide range of free GIS apps is called ArcGIS Online. It's this solution which also manages the identities and data access within your organization. It's through ArcGIS Online, one can easily deploy what we call a fit-for-purpose land administration solution. At the core of the fit-for-purpose land administration solution is ArcGIS Online. This is our hosted solution where one can manage permissions and access rights, configure and publish apps to support specific workflows, whether in the field, back office editing, or publishing to the public. You can also edit your data model, in this case, the land administration domain model. You can also perform analytics and leverage external content such as imagery and base maps. 
One of the recommended field apps to support field data collection for first registration is called Collector. Collector is used to capture points, lines, and polygons, as well as related features and attributes. It can work in a connected or disconnected environment and can be paired with an external GPS device, enabling one to achieve survey grade accuracy. Once collected and in a connected environment, the data is synced with your ArcGIS Online organization, where it can be subsequently shared with other groups across your organization or published through public facing applications. These public facing apps can help to answer specific questions and ultimately reduce counter traffic from the public while also increasing transparency. Using web services, one can also join the parcel geometry with features from other databases, such as that of a computer assisted mass appraisal system or land registry system, essentially allowing one to geo enable these other business systems. So, why this approach? Well, it's fast to implement. It's also scalable and upgradable. It's very low cost. It's reliable and not requiring any software development. It can allow surveyors to get that survey grade accuracy that's, their, that's needed. It's also standards based and can work in a disconnected environment. Before I wrap up and turn it over to Frank Pichel from Cadasta, I just want to talk briefly about a new um, grant program that Esri's put in place over the past year or two. This grant program is called the Land Administration Modernization Program. The objective is to empower an organization to establish a sustainable GIS-based land administration system that enables them to collect, manage, and disseminate authentic, accurate, and authoritative land tenure and valuation information. This offer includes a variety of software um, licenses and tools, ranging from enterprise to desktop, as well as uh, named users for different types of applications. It's open up to over 80 countries across the developing world. And it's important to point out that this is only eligible for legally mandated cadastral organizations. It does provide access to the full Esri platform and is a four year program with maintenance. The licenses are perpetual, which means they do not expire. And it all comes included for a small annual administrative fee of $10,000 per year. So before I turn it over to Frank, I want to highlight just a few resources. So if you'd like to get more information, uh, we have a link here where you can connect with one of our experts. We also have more information on Esri's Land Administration Modernization Program, where you can find out which countries are eligible. There's also uh, a link here to the Land Administration Solutions page. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Frank to talk about a specific use case um, from Cadasta in the India context. Great, thanks for that, Tim. Um, and really appreciate the introduction uh, both, both you and Brent have provided in terms of land administration concepts, and more specifically around, around fit for purpose land administration, which is honestly at the heart of our work here at Cadasta. So just to give a, a little bit of a background on, on who we are and why we were created, um, you know, my background comes from very formal land administration, as well as the background of many of the original members of the team here at Cadasta. Um, and we, we had a lot of cumulative experience working with national level systems implementing your traditional top down registry and cadastral systems. Um, the reality we often found was that, however, you know, putting these systems in was only as good as the data being put into the systems. And oftentimes we're relying on antiquated, outdated data or, or just a lack of data to begin with. So the reality we find is that even if we were successful in putting in this national registry and cadaster, the level of coverage it would have would be very low which is where we, we run into this number that, that some of you all might have seen of an estimated 70 to 80% of land remaining undocumented globally. So despite these systems going in, the challenge of how do we bring in more data always rises to the top. And the end result of this is, is functionally in many emerging economies, a land administration system that, that simply doesn't work. 
where we had more success though was in coming at it from more of a bottom-up approach as opposed to a top-down that is how do we work directly with de facto land administrators maybe not at the national level could be a customary leader could be a slum dwellers associations or perhaps it's a local government affiliate that that needs this data that can put it to use and is managing land even if they are not the ones that in, in a particular context are actually issuing titles or deeds. So it was with this background that Cadasso was founded as a nonprofit uh, in 2015 with a mission of, of being uh, the, the leading provider of technical tools and support to allow for communities to directly document and manage their, their land information. Really what we want to do is, is bridge that gap between top-down government-led approaches and bottom-up community-driven approaches. Concepts such as participatory mapping, community mapping, et cetera, ha have been around for, for decades, but the challenge is bringing this locally captured data and aligning it with national data standards. So how do we bring this, this local data um, and, and ensure that there's some formal recognition of it? At Cadasso, we very much recognize that the, the data we work with, that our partners are working with, um, has a value. You know, we, we don't look at it as a, uh, uh, a simple binary solution when it's title or no title, formal or informal. The reality is in many of the places we work, they work within an idea of a continuum of, of property rights. So there's all sorts of incremental approaches that will strengthen their property rights. Maybe it's taking what had been an oral customary agreement and documenting it for the first time. So there's some legal weight, even if not formally registered, that this land has been bestowed upon someone else uh, and that person now has a right to it. So taking what had been an oral, digitizing it, documenting it or perhaps working with government and turning what had been informal agreements or occupancy and turning it into a lease agreement, something with a defined term. Because we know, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll speak to some of the case studies, but local organizations, local government, and even national government can begin to use this data regardless of where it fits on the spectrum of formality. And ultimately what we care about is it will also strengthen that right for the individual, the community that been, had been formally left out of the system. We recognize we are, we are not governments. We can't always uh, issue a title or a deed, but we can incrementally strengthen those rights. At the heart of it, we can provide our partners even with uh, in the absence of any other documented information a, a folio of their property rights, building a record of community recognition of their land claim, including the details of where the property claim is, what evidence might, might support that claim. Perhaps it's a transfer document, uh, could be a tax receipt, a utility bill, anything that is showing some recognition of that right by a, by a formal authority. Uh, and, and compounded with evidence that we help our partners to define. And that could be, um, uh, you know, neighbor testimonials to boundaries. It could be videos uh, capturing an agreement of boundaries. All of this is strengthening the property rights. So giving some background on our organization at Cadasta, we are uh, in our first years of operation, we, we built on an, a full open source stack um, and we're really owning the entire process. The, the, the thinking was that we could be um, a one size fits all approach in some degree, to some degree. Um, that if we built a, a, a solution that's easy enough for our partners, they will be able to go out and collect data uh, and manage it. The reality was that that did work for a number of our partners, but ultimately we were hearing more and more from our existing partners that what they needed wasn't just technical support. It was also um, or support with the tools, but it was technical support in terms of their operations, in terms of how they're working with land information. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, I think by Brent, you know, there's the concept of the land administration domain model, an international standard but often they're domestic standards as well that are offshoots or might be uh, separate from the LADM, but that we could align our data collection and our processes with. So working with partners, identifying what data should we be collecting? 
what is the national standards for data? How accurate should this data be? Um, will digitizing from imagery work? Or do we need higher, higher accuracy hardware in the field? Um, and if so, what? How, what, what, what's going to drive those decisions for our partners? So all of these questions, you know, how the, creating a data model, adhering to national standards, providing training on data collection, providing training on how to use the data, how to leverage the data for decision making, um, really led us to finding that we needed, uh, that we were having more of a hands-on approach with many of our partners. So it was in that context and that background that we began thinking about how do we how do we make the best use of our resources. So we made the decision to to ramp up our field staff to to increase the ability to support partners in the field, but also looking at um, what our existing technology stack is and was, and recognizing that many of the feature requests coming in were were relatively. Um, basic features. So instead of reinventing the wheel, so to speak, we began to look at how do we leverage other tools out there um, so that we're not building that and supporting that whole technology stack. So we, we sought input from a number of organizations um, and ultimately um, after reviewing tenders from, from that, that handful of organizations, ended up selecting Esri to be the, the GIS backbone of our platform infrastructure um, because we knew it could really address the core core needs we needed um, and many of the feature requests that were coming in for our partners. And if we look at the current situation of our platform, um, right around that time when we moved into the Esri world was in 2018, probably March, and it was actually very well timed. We were bringing on a new partner that was significantly greater in scale than many of our own partners, uh, old partners, um, and we're having really much more advanced functionality needs. And we'll talk a little bit more about this specific partner later in the presentation, but it allowed us to bring this partner on once we moved into the Esri environment. We couldn't have um, deployed uh, our partner in the old environment given the needs they had. Um, I think they were up to at 1.700 simultaneous data collectors. Uh, they were using a combination of drone imagery, satellite imagery, and field data collection. Uh, and simply put, our, our uh, open source platform wouldn't have been able to, to handle the scale and the demand that we um, were seeing from, from this partner. So it was well-timed that move to the Esri environment because it allowed us to really onboard a significant number of households uh, very quickly. But what we really look at as, as our value add as Cadasta is the combination. So Esri, as we said, is the backbone of our technology. But for many of our partners, they don't need that full Esri environment. Their needs are, are more basic. And so what, what working in the Esri environment allows us to do is, is scale the platform based on prep. Uh, partner needs, uh, but ensure that we're providing the most core aspects, you know, secure data storage, um, the ability to visualize their data and do light analysis of it um, with a limited GIS experience, uh, providing dashboards so that they can make the data publicly available or available to, to decision makers in real time, the ability to pull in other data sets. For many of our partners, you know, they're coming from having very little uh, spatial information. The limit might be using, you know, Google Earth, but having the ability to pull in all of the layers that come via the, the Esri environment has enabled partners to begin to not only look at the imagery, but contextualize it with historic imagery, with uh, topographic maps, with soil maps, with any one of the myriad of, uh, of data layers we can pull in. And it's really increased the ability for our partners to make decisions with the data. It's not just static information of the polygons and points relevant to, to, their, uh, to the parcels and land use, but the greater um, functionality to put the data to use. So while at the heart of our work is the Cadasta platform, that secure repository that can be scaled for our partners' needs, but it's also the fact that we can support that platform with mobile applications that directly integrate. 
So whether our partners are using Cadasta surveys, our own branded uh, offshoot of Survey123, or Survey123, or Collector, or even coming out of a, um, an environment of using other XLS-based data collection forms, we can bring that data into the platform in a disconnected environment. Um, and at the same time, providing the, the, data, um, the data model um, relevant to our partners directly in their data collection forms. And then finally, behind that, as mentioned earlier, the tools was only a part of the solution. Uh, we found early on that just providing the tools wasn't enough for our partners. Um, so it's, it's looking at how do we better provide the training and technical support to our partners. Um, and through that, we've, we've been able in recent months to add our regional trainers uh, based in South Asia, East Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa, and adding one for Latin America in the coming weeks um, to really provide that support at a more local or regional basis, uh, driving down costs and ensuring uh, a knowledge of the local context. And we're, we're finding that our, our field support has been critical. As mentioned earlier, the ability to provide that direct training to work with our partners to ensure their data collection approaches and data, mod, uh, data models adhere to the national and international standards has really led to greater formalization of those rights. So if we think back around the continuum, it's how do we move our partners farthest along, securing their rights as much as possible. And a great example of this is the, the project mentioned earlier, the big, the big bump in the graph of partners using the Cadasta platform. And this partner comes out of a, a, a Odisha state, India. And in this case, we work directly with the state government as well as Tata Trust, one of the largest NGOs in India. Um, the state government had recognized that approximately 25% of the state population of around 50 million people were slum dwellers. So urban informal residents that lacked any documentation to the land they lived on. The state kind of assessed those needs and recognized there's a, there, there's a mutual need to formalize these rights. The citizens themselves want the security of knowing that they will, will possess that property next week, next month, next year, and can leave it to their, to their family. They need the data, the, the recognition of their rights to allow them to access government benefit schemes, government subsidies. And at the same time, the government uh, of, of Odisha state needs this data. Um, they recognize they can't ignore this population that's informal. It's uh, simply too big, representing, you know, 12, 13 million people, a huge voting block. They can't be ignored. They're demanding services but the state lacks the data they need to deliver those services, to provide support and to formalize their rights. The state did a, did a long analysis of, of how best to go about issuing title to these uh, slum dwellers and, and saw that for many of the slum dwellers, they were living on state land, either owned by a state agency, a state owned, a state -owned business or other, um, that would allow the government to move more quickly in formalizing their rights. But they couldn't issue title. That was not in the purview and the authority of the, of the state government. But then the next question was, what could be done? The path towards title is too long, convoluted, and expensive to embark on. But instead, could they issue some other intermediate recognition of rights? So it's in this context that they invented a new tenure type and have begun issuing certificates of occupancy, which are inheritable and mortgageable, but non-transferable, um, with the fear being that, that transfer rights might in fact um, lead to the eviction of many of these uh, residents in the slums that are often well situated within the cities of Odisha State. So in that context, the program was designed and working with Tata Trust, they identified the first 1300 uh, slums in Odisha state that were on state land and could be eligible for formalization. Tata Trust as a trusted intermediary could then work with the slum dwellers in each of the slums to create a legal uh, entity, a slum dwellers association that would be responsible for directly collecting and managing the data. So it was 
wasn't government going out to collect the data. Instead, it was Tata Trust going out using Cadasta tools that they'd been trained on and then training data collectors from that Slum Dwellers Association that are known members of the community and trusted to go out and collect the data using the Cadasta tools and a combination of drone imagery to identify boundaries. Anyone working in slums can imagine the challenge of trying to reach a corner point of polygons when each building or each uh, uh, house directly abuts one another, right? You, you can't physically access that, that uh, corner point. But using very high resolution drone imagery, five, six centimeters, it becomes very easy, easy to digitize boundaries and then quickly have the residents of the community review and make sure there's agreement. So this, uh, the project started in late 2016 and in early eight, 2018, the data collection really got underway. Since then, over 130,000 households have been documented and the first 70,000 households have now rec uh, received their certificates of occupancy. So we're looking at about 400,000 people that had never had secure rights to the land they lived on, now for the first time having that security and already beginning to see the impact, the ability to now register their kids in schools because they now have an address, the ability to use the data to access government subsidy schemes, um, and the ability now for government to deliver services to begin putting in roads, sewage, sanitation, uh, and begin to more transparently and equitably collect property tax. Um, it's really been a win-win uh, for both the citizens and the state, and we're seeing the project uh, now expand uh, elsewhere in Odisha State and an interest by other state governments and municipal governments in, in India to replicate this process. Um, so just a quick example of, of the, the dashboard that they use for quick um, display of information for some of the decision makers in Odisha, Odisha State just to show where where the houses are that they're working in, the level of the uh, uh, various data sets that are important to them, and the total households now now documented. And you can see I was, was off in there up to 167,000 um, from the 140,000 I'd mentioned earlier. So just a couple of examples of, of how, uh, or an example of how Cadasta works. But important to realize we are not limited to working in that urban, uh, uh, urban formalization space. And in fact, many of our partners exist elsewhere on the spectrum. So for some, including in India, we're working in a customary context. So how do we formalize rural land rights with customary groups, with communities, et cetera? Uh, and some of those groups are working directly towards formal recognition of rights, but others for uh, advocacy. So whether it's a partner in Colombia that's putting using the data captured to put pressure on the government to recognize the rights that they uh, that, that politicians had promised to do so during campaign stump speeches are now being held held to the fire by the data collected. Other partners are using it for an aspect of traceability. So supply chain, how do we show that um, a specific good comes from a location when the person at that location doesn't have a title or deed? And then finally, to the point of, of for, for land use planning and resource management. So for those communities that might not have formal recognition of their rights, but are de facto stewards of the land, how are they deciding what is agricultural land? What lands should be set aside for pastoralists? Where should the housing be? We can provide the data layers to allow them to, to make those decisions. So I'll just mention briefly, um, uh, I'd be remiss not to include, but we, we recently launched our own uh, Cadasta Land Rights Challenge Fund for, uh, for partners and new partners looking to increase their data collection ability. Um, so directly we'll, we'll help uh, cover the cost of data collection in the field, uh, could ask the support and sometimes hardware as needed. So grant amounts are limited to $10,000 um, and we will be beginning to review those grants uh, applications next week. So for anyone that might be interested and hasn't already heard about it, um, we would invite you all to take a look at the uh, at the website. Uh, feel free to email grants at cadasta.org with any questions, and we look forward to, to seeing some applications. 
Um, so with that, thank you all for the interest in, in Cadasta. Uh, feel free to contact me or check out our website, the links provided, um, and we'll uh, jump over and, and welcome you all to provide any questions. All right, thanks a lot, Frank. Nicely done. Um, there are a lot of questions. Some of them um, have to do with LADM, particularly this LADM uh, work in Colombia. Uh, and it does, and there's a special version of LADM for Columbia, and that's pretty typical with LADM, is to look at the in-country requirements or the project requirements and modify the basic schema to uh, to fit specific needs. And the platform, the ArcGIS platform, works the same way. It can be configured to meet specific legal requirements and specific project requirements that that uh, that all software that that can meet all, all the all the conditions of uh, the unique conditions uh, in country. So there was another question, um, Frank. I'm going to let you take a piece of this one. Um, one of the one of the uh, questions is how do you ensure? Let me see if I can find it here. How do you ensure the accuracy? Uh, of capturing position information that that's no problem we handle the how to handle the accuracy in collector um, here's a question specifically for cadasta how are you how do you deal with parcels uh with neighbors and, and rights with neighbors how do you adjudicate between neighboring properties Sure, and that, that often comes up. And, you know, we do not want to put ourselves in the position of, of making those decisions or determinations. Um, it, it's best handled at the local level, and we can usually provide recommendations based on the national context in terms of legal avenues or uh, alternative dispute resolution actors or customary actors that, that can assist with um, resolving disputes. What we do want to do, however, is, is capture the data around the dispute. Um, and that's something that often becomes apparent with our users in the platform, is once the data is captured and we see that there's either a dispute about the boundary or when the data is collected that there's a slight overlap in interpretation of it. Um, and what we can do is make it readily apparent uh, within the platform to alert that there is an overlapping right so that the partner or the community can make a determination as how best to handle. Uh, here's another question. Uh, any organization will be asking how to secure collected data specifically if they're working for governments. Well, one thing that separates or distinguishes or differentiates the ArcGIS platform is it is a secure environment that adheres to modern security protocols. And if you go to trust.arcgis.com, it lists all the areas where um, uh, all the security protocols that ArcGIS conforms to. Okay, here's another question. How Parcel Editor will work to Indian Land Records data model scenario? Is there any country specific data model being designed? So I think that's a, so using land records data in India, Frank, did you guys use a specific data model for the Odisha project? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it did not adhere to uh, a specific data model. We really relied on the data requirements from the state government. Okay, so um, thank you. What is the roadmap for workforce about disconnected work to support the duties uh, assigning for field workers? You know, I don't know um, specifically what functionality uh, you're referring to in workforce. Uh, for those the rest of you on the webinar, workforce is a, is a set of applications for scheduling and managing field work where projects are, where your, where your field workers are. We, we can track field workers if that's a necessity. So if there's a specific requirement uh, in workforce that's not there, please let us know. Um, that, that would be very helpful. Uh, what's the smallest and largest population size that have been mapped with Cadasta? Same for parcels. I'll take the parcels one. 
Um, I think we have 2.2 million is the is the largest organization that we have mapped in parcels. I'm not positive of that. Tim, do you know? I know um, British Columbia is 2.2. Um, TerraNet uh, in Canada, I think, has over 15 million parcels. In 15 the, million? Yeah, the RGS parcel fabric. Okay, yeah, so don't, so, you know, the uh, size and scalability uh, is not an issue. Uh, what about with Cadastra, Frank? Yeah, so the, our largest data set is probably the, the Odisha that's um, yeah, 165,000. Um, and we have a number of partners that are, you know, on the smaller side, either collecting community boundaries. So it might only be 15 communities, but could represent a much larger population or community or, you know, new new partners that are in the early stages of household data collection that are still, you know, in the 100 to 200 range. Um, most of our partners, I would say, are kind of in the five to 10,000 range. Perfect. Okay, now here's a really good question. I like this question. Um, has a parcel fabric, you know, does it have a role in the architecture with fit for purpose and with ArcGIS Online? And yes, the uh, absolutely. Fit for purpose is designed to get you up and running, collecting data, getting a system in place. And as that system matures and grows, when the parcel fabric becomes uh, a benefit, you would implement it on the same data model, on the same platform, in the same system. So one of the real benefits of this approach is you get started with fit for purpose and you scale into district and enterprise cadastral systems. Uh, do you have data management software? Inside the ArcGIS platform are all the tools to manage all types of data, whether it's imagery, LIDAR, survey, uh, tabular data, mapping data. So yes, that's all part of the, that's part of the ArcGIS platform. Okay, Tim, this one might be, uh, might be a good one for you. What applications or tools are used? It says here developed, but um, these are, I should just say are configured. Um, to manage the cadaster in a cadaster agency's offices, such as QC editing, reparcelation, uh, and meaning remapping parcels, uh, and more. Sure. So I'm going to answer this um, both from a fit for purpose, and then has that kind of system or solution can evolve into more uh, kind of enterprise-wise system. But from a, a fit for purpose approach, there's a variety of applications that can be used for the field data collection. So actually capturing the, the parcel boundaries and the related attributes. And once that data is brought into the ArcGIS Online environment, it can be maintained um, as different edits need to be uh, made in terms of the, the boundaries itself. And then that data can be published out through a variety of different applications, um, either just for visualization purposes, for further editing, or for analysis. Now, if you were to evolve from that more ArcGIS online environment and fit for purpose into more of a, um, if you want to say enterprise system that's using what we call ArcGIS Enterprise and ArcGIS Pro, where we have our parcel fabric solution, um, the parcel fabric itself is a purpose built, built piece of technology to maintain parcels, including uh, a lot of the common transactions related to subdividing a parcel, merging a parcel, creating new subdivisions, maintaining parcel history, improving spatial accuracy of your data, as well as the, the QC um, and QA of that data according to different rules that you will configure uh, within a rules-based engine. So it's really, once you kind of move into that purpose-built solution, um, within ArcGIS Pro, you have a more robust set of purpose-built tools for managing parcels. Perfect. All right, Frank, here's one for you. Who are Cadastra's partners? Yeah, so it's, it's a range. Um, more often than not, it's uh, NGOs and or community groups, maybe with a customary, you know, a customary authority. Um, but more and more we're seeing it as also including local government. So that could be a municipal or kind of a, a district, county or state like we saw with Odisha um, that have a need for the data and can no longer really rely on, um, you know, a traditional ministry of lands to, to provide the data to them. Um, so all of that to say, most often our, our interventions start with a with a local organization, probably a nonprofit community-based 
organization that is working on property rights but needs a better way to collect, manage, and use the data. Perfect. Okay, so here's a um, here's another question about history. Uh, one thing, so uh, it's a follow-up question here um, for editing reparcelation and more. For example, maintaining history of, of the parcel mapping. Inside the parcel fabric, which is just part of the ArcGIS platform, the, the, the tools and technology for managing parcels, are the capabilities uh, built right in to manage history. So oftentimes when we think about technology systems, you hear history and you think of database history. Well, this is different than database history. This actually follows the parcel boundaries uh, through time and you know what was done, you know, and you know who did the edits to the parcels. And the way it's structured, uh, you can connect a specific document actually to the to the change in parcels if it's a split or a conveyance and you want to attach a document or reference a document to those edits uh, you can do that as well so it's the, you know as Tim mentioned this is really really a uh, a purpose-built solution for managing cadastral systems uh, we have in just this latest release we have over 50 man years of development so it's really a uh, uh, it's it's really a robust system. Um, so here's another one for Frank, and then I'm going to read a question while he's answering this question. Uh, how can we become partners with Cadasta? Thanks for that, Brent. Um, yeah, so uh, the best thing to do would be go to our website and then go to Partner Intake. Um, let me double check that. And you can always reach out directly to me at fpachel at cadasta.org and I'll make sure you get connected to the right folks. Okay, perfect. Hey, Catherine, here's one um, for you. For those of you who know, Catherine Smythe is online, one of our technical people here uh, answering the difficult questions. Um, this is a really good question and it has to do with the topology, how it's managed in the parcel fabric. My location, the boundary of neighboring parcels are separated by one meter or a half meter from one property and a half meter from the other property boundary. With this separated two boundaries, is there a general rule to use overlying lines, overlapping lines? Sure, thanks Brent. Hi everyone, I'm happy to be with you. You may have seen me in the answers. Um, so I'd actually like to address this question along with a few others that we're getting about parcel fabric functionality. So the parcel fabric enables uh, what we call a topology on points, lines, and polygons that are all related to one another. So if I collect a piece of property as a polygon, for example, I can choose to enable different rules such as whether the property overlaps or does not overlap and I can use that to QA QC my data when I'm going back through edits that have been collected in the field or the office. So this really is, as Tim mentioned, a holistic answer to a lot of these different questions that I've been getting regarding how we manage cadaster in general. If you're interested in learning more about that, we have a lot of resources that Brent mentioned um, in meetup.com, and I'd be happy to post another link to that as well. I think Brent uh, posted one, but all of those videos uh, going into each of those different categories are available for your perusal. And if you'd like more information, I'd be happy to talk about it. Thanks, Catherine. And for those questions that we don't get to, there'll be a survey at the end of this webinar. Uh, so post a question in there if we don't get to it. As Frank mentioned, you can you can contact Frank. His his email's up there. Mine's pretty simple. B Jones at Desri.com. Tim's is Tim Fella T Fella at Esri.com. So the uh, uh, but we'll, we're happy to, you know, to stay on as well. So, um, yeah. So 
I'm going to take control of this. Let's see. If you go back, to, someone wants the slide of the meetups in there. If you go into the chat box, um, all the links to all of those um, resources are in the chat box. So if you have a hard time getting that, and we can put those in the uh, uh, in the follow-up to this as well. Now here's a question: Can you work offline um, in the field? Yes. So the way that works is you take the collector app and you identify an area that you want to work in and you cache that data. We know in many parts of the world uh, the, the cell network is unreliable and in other parts of the world it may be reliable but data is very expensive. So we can cache that data on a mobile device whether it's an Android or an iOS take that data into the field and collect data. Uh, you can collect data in a, a wide, there's a variety of ways to collect data. And as I mentioned, you can connect an external GPS that can meet, that will meet any accuracy requirements that you have. Uh, we recently have done some single centimeter work here. Um, so we know that that's quite easy to configure and to, and to get going. All right. Um, does the parcel fabric support LADM? Uh, that's a big yes, and we have actually we have a configuration of that that we can share out with you if you would like. Some of this information is on GitHub. Uh, some of this information is uh, on Catherine's laptop, um, but we're happy to share that out. Uh, so don't hesitate to contact uh, us for that. Well, we're coming to the top of the hour here. Um, I want to thank Tim Fell again uh, for his time and expertise here. And uh, and Frank Pichel, of course, uh, and could ask his time, effort, and commitment to uh, to fit for purpose and to documenting land rights. And I want to thank everyone online uh, for all of your time. Mm -hmm.